Yeah, right now, God, I just want to give you that heart of worship, Lord. I want to offer unto you a sacrifice of praise. God, that means when I don't feel like it, I still worship you. Lord, when I, when I don't have enough money, I still worship you. Yeah, when somebody in my life is about to pass on, I still worship you. God, we give you praise for who you are. We ask that you will anoint as your word will go forth. And God, you will speak to your people divinely in this exact moment in history. Move now. Speak to us now, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you, praise team. Anybody love Jesus? You love him so much, sometimes you feel like you want to explode. You want to blow up in a good way. I get that way a lot of times. I think that's just the soul part of me telling the body part of me you can't reach the place where I'm going. <laughs> Amen. Amen. This body is so limited, so, so limited with health issues. And we're running out of time and we don't have much time left. This body has got just a few short years left. But the soul man of you is going to last forever. And that soul man's crying to get out. Say, give me a new body. I'm ready to go walking on streets of gold through gates of pearl. And I'm ready to shout before the king with a voice that will never wear out. Yeah. Amen. Sing for 53 days straight without your voice wearing out. That's heaven, folks. Go for 97 hours in a row and you never have to go to bed. And you're still going strong. That's heaven. That's eternity. And for the first time in all of your life, you'll be able to stand in the presence of God without being knocked to the ground. And, and when I'm saying that, I'm talking about because our body cannot stand the full glory. But one day, he's going to give you a body that's glorified, and it will have the ability to stand in the presence of our king. Amen. Heaven is for real. It's for real. So what are you preaching about this morning, Pastor? Well, I'm preaching on the family business. A family business. It's going to get kind of neat. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, it's going to get neat. <clears throat> that means it won't be messy. It's going to be neat. Got some good word today. The family business. August 1st, 2002. I don't talk a whole lot about my business. I purposely choose not to. Uh, but August 1st, 2002, we opened Nights Foreign in Rainbow City. <clears throat> and uh, we were taking a big leap of faith. And I'll tell you why. Because uh, less than a year before that, September 11th, 2001, we'd been hit by a terrorist attack. It shook our nation so strongly that the economy was affected. And uh, it wasn't an ideal time to start a new business. Uh, matter of fact, uh, there were some folks that really felt like we weren't going to make it very long. Uh, and uh, I, I had a few doubts myself, and that's why I had to really pray and say, God, if it's your will, I will do this, but I need to know. At that point, my life had no thought of ever pastoring a church, never knew I would. So I was just looking at it like, hey, I'll just keep going to church, be faithful, pay my tithes, take my kids, my wife. And, uh, but, you know, i got to provide. So we opened us up a store, and God has blessed us. Chloe and um, Roxy Jane have never known anything besides me having a business. That's just the way life is. <clears throat> In that store, we've had birthday parties. Uh, we've had... Uh, pastoral meetings anybody ever anybody ever been in a meeting at my store <laughs> hey man, not necessarily bad but you know just <laughs> hey we'll get together and go over a few things um interestingly enough when we started new haven church of god we were like where in the world are we going to meet well guess what we did we met in my warehouse and so we had church for one month in that store so it wasn't just a family business it was a ministry location it was a place where that God would be glorified. And it's always been referred to as the family business. You may not really think on this uh, or, or think of it in this way, but God has a family business. And you're in it. And he's been making big plans. And he's invested a lot of work and preparation into the success of his business through you on this earth. So all of you have got a huge role to play. Some of you are... Uh, managers, some of you carry out labor tasks. Uh, whatever that you're gifted in is probably where God's going to put you to work in his kingdom. So know this, that you've got a role to play 
in the family business of God. We're going to begin with Luke chapter 2, start with verse 40. And the child, speaking of Jesus, grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. <clears throat> I love the fact that the one that we know as the Lamb of God, which was Jesus, in this 12th year had to walk through the same temple where that little precious firstborn male lambs were being sacrificed, not just on behalf of others, but even on his behalf. And I would just wonder if when Jesus was walking through the streets of Jerusalem, if he happened to get a glance of one of his veins, and he thought, you know, it won't be but a few short years, little lambs, that this blood that I have in my veins is going to be shed for the salvation of all who will call upon my name. It just makes me wonder if Jesus kind of looked at himself and thought, won't be much longer, there'll never have to be another goat or lamb or bull sacrificed on behalf of the sins of the world because the blood that I see that right now is the color blue will one day turn red from the whips of a scourge and from the nails that uh, hang me to a cross and because of the thorns in my head, that blue blood will turn red when it hits oxygen. And because of that blood that now runs through my veins, the world will have opportunity for salvation. It's because of that blood that you and I sit in this room saved and on our way to glory. It was because he shed his blood. He would no longer allow the substitutionary sacrifice of the lamb to take his place. But he said, I alone will offer redemption for all mankind. And so as he's making his way into the temple, we find in verse 42 when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And when the time came, Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple. You know, I can't help but wonder these things, knowing who Jesus is, and based on Hebrews chapter 9, that Jesus Christ fashioned the temple that was in heaven. It was a, a temple of perfection. It also contained its own mercy seat. And we understand that when God gave the blueprints to Moses for the tabernacle, that he was just making a copy of what was already in front of God's, or in the area of God's throne, in the temple of God. Up in heaven, there was a, a building fashioned, according to Hebrews 9, not by human hands. John chapter 1 tells us that all things were created by Jesus, so that tells me that the temple in heaven had to be made by himself, by his own hands. So I just can't help but wonder when Jesus was walking through the temple if he admired it and he thought, you know, that looks good. And hey, that uh, curtain up there in front of the Holy of Holies, that's pretty nice, but I've seen better. Uh, oh, that, that laver there where they wash their hands, it's pretty cool, but I've touched better. Uh, you know, the, the way that they talk about the glory falling back in Solomon's day and, and at other times and however so often an angel might show up and talk to somebody like Zacharias. I, I know that's awesome, but I've, I've experienced better. You know, I just can't help but wonder that when Jesus was walking through the temple that he was just thinking, all this is is a type and a shadow of better things that people have not even seen yet with their own eyes. Oh, hallelujah. So we understand that uh, Mary Mary and Joseph followed the law of Moses and they took Jesus into the temple. It's very important, people of God, if you're a parent, would you please raise your hand? If you're a parent in this room and you have children that uh, have, are, are still remain in your home, I encourage you to bring your children to church. Amen? Yes. Not to drop them off, not to say, hey, can someone come pick them up? Now, if you're working, I understand that. But if you're able to come, you're physically able, you need to bring your children to church. Amen. What better example than to bring them with you and let them see what it's like when mom and daddy lift up holy hands and begin worshiping God. It's not just about showing up and saying, hey, we're at church. Now let's go through the two hours and go to eat. It's, it's, it's another thing when you bring them to church and you show them an example of worship. Amen. And that's the purpose of bringing our children to church is to instruct them in the ways of the Lord. And then, of course, to train them in their classes, teach them about God and his word. Verse 43, when they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it, but supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. Now, to me, this part always kind of cracks me up a little bit because I think about that fear of getting left at Walmart 
or going to the mall and your parents like leave you on the toy aisle and, and they, they walk over to the shoe department and you think they've left you forever and you're going to get uh, put in some government home. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I'm going to have to finally go live with Aunt Susie. Ah! You know, you just have all these crazy thoughts. Or somebody might kidnap you. You know, you got that fear. But it, it, it's humorous to me because of all people, Mary and Joseph lost the Son of God. <laughs> How do you do that? When he's 12 years old, you're thinking, okay, if there's anybody we're going to watch, Joseph, it's this kid right here. Nothing can happen to him. But you know what happens? He gets They, they lose him. Well, the Bible tells us they start out on a journey, and they travel for a whole day. Now, I just want to throw this in for good measure because you know every so often i got to crack a joke. I, when I studied this about them losing Jesus, for some reason Luke 19 and 10 came, up to my, came into my mind. And I can picture Jesus. Now, he's an adult by the time he says this. But he says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. I hope Mary was in the crowd when he said that, and that he looked over at her and kind of gave her a wink. Yeah, it just makes you wonder. The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost, Mama. Uh, you know, you never know. It could have happened. And then Mary would probably say, Son, move on. Move on with your theology. They went one day before they even knew he was missing. All right, so then they have to turn around and travel another full day to get back to Jerusalem. And once they're in Jerusalem, they spend a third day looking for Jesus. According to Josephus, the Jewish historian, there were over 3 million people who would enter Jerusalem and stay during the time of Passover. Now, I don't know what the population is anymore of Gadsden. I know Southside's close to 9,000. But I want you to picture this many people, uh, 3 million people in a city area. It would have been so packed that just trying to hold on to your family and get down a street would be difficult. You ever been in uh, different areas where that the crowd, like if you're going to a concert, maybe in Birmingham or Atlanta, or maybe a sporting event, going to, uh, <coughs> well, I had to go there, Bryant-Denny Stadium, where dreams go to die. Can I get an amen? <coughs> Uh, if you're in a crowd that's so huge and, and you're feeling like you're pushed and you can barely move without uh, or, or you can barely stand still because of the crowd, that's probably what Jerusalem felt like during the time of the Passover. So we can kind of understand how they might have gotten separated. But here's my question to you. Before we're too quick, like I just was, to jump on Mary and Joseph for losing the Son of God of all people, why don't we ask ourselves a very personal question? Have we ever lost sight of Jesus? Mm. There's a thought, isn't it? Have we ever lost sight of Jesus? Have we ever gotten so busy, so concerned about making money and paying the bills and, and getting a new house or a new car or working towards some huge financial goal that we lost sight of Jesus? Well, since I'm a preacher, I might as well step inside the church and talk about ministry a minute. Have we ever gotten so consumed by something we were planning, an event, uh, uh, a ministry? Have we ever become so focused on our, our, uh, what we're called to do that we lost sight of the reason we're even doing it? Isn't that a thought? What if we became so engrossed with an idea that God planted in us that we put him on a shelf and we said, hey, I'm going to do whatever i got to do to make this happen, but God, all the other stuff you're wanting to deal with in my life, I don't have time for that right now because you know I've got to focus. You know I've got to focus on this ministry. So if there's stuff in my life that's going to mess up and throw a roadblock in my ministry five years down the road, I don't want to hear about that right now because all I'm concerned about is getting this uh, thing to come to pass. And God said, but if you don't let me deal with what I need to in your life today, it's going to blow up in your face two and a half years down the road. So the, the, the truth is, no matter what you're doing for God, if you lose sight of Jesus, it can throw a roadblock in the middle of your mission. So what do we do? We follow through with what God tells us to do, but we never lose sight of the one who told us to do it. Can I get an amen? Amen. Keep your eyes on Jesus. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 12, verse 2, the first part of that verse says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Why should we keep our eyes on him? Because he's the only one who knows where we started and where we're supposed to end up. He is the author and he is the finisher of our faith. Let's go on with verse 45 in the book of Luke. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. 
Now, so it was that after three days they found him in the temple. Well, imagine that. Look at your neighbor and say, imagine that. In the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. In order to find Jesus, they had to go back to where they left him. The same applies to us today, church. If we ever get so busy, so caught up in, oh, I've got to you know, plan this out and carry this out and do what I'm supposed to, what the pastors asked me to do, well, I hope you will, but don't get so busy that you lose sight of Jesus. But if you ever do lose sight of the king, he can always be found where you left him. Where's that, pastor? In his word. You see, when we walk away from his word and we get too caught up in our plans, then we've got to get back to the word where we originally discovered him. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Where else do we find him? We find him in our prayer closet where we left him. Same place we used to meet with him when we didn't have as busy of a schedule. We weren't so worried about the new car and the nicer outfits. And, oh, my goodness, I've got to get $3,000 for Christmas so we can buy everybody a gift. Before you stressed out over mess like that, there used to be time you spent in your prayer room where you said, God, it doesn't really matter if I, if I got 3000 in the bank or not, if I got, can buy everybody a gift or not, what I'm going to do is, is uh, bless you, love you, pray to you, and if I just got to write people a nice little card and hand it to them for Christmas saying I'm praying blessings over you in Jesus' name, then so be it. Amen. But don't get all stressed out over what is expected of you. The only thing you need to be concerned about is what does Jesus expect of you. Amen. So the Bible tells us here they had to go back to where they left him in order to find him. Verse 47, And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Now we know that Jesus' parents and the people in the temple were amazed when they found him. But it's just as amazing to me that after three days, a 12-year-old boy was still sitting in the temple talking to these people about theology and about the Word because here's what I'm thinking. If you're a Jewish boy and you're 12 years old, shouldn't you be like running after cute little Jewish girls? I mean, shouldn't you be hanging out with the Jewish boys and say, oh, check her out. Oh, look at that long robe that goes all the way down to her ankles. <laughs> you know, I'm being funny because that's kind of how they dress. They were very modest, praise God. Look at that finger on, on her hand there. I can see her finger. Oh, check her pinky out. Glory. <laughs> I would expect that Jesus would be going around the market and checking out the new apples and the oranges and the peaches and the pears. Might throw a little olive in there off Mount of Olives. Glory. I mean, isn't that normal stuff for a 12-year-old to be doing? I mean, just hanging out, throwing rocks. I mean, can't you imagine they said, hey, we're having a stoning on uh, Fourth Avenue. Oh, I'm there. Get my slingshot. <laughs> I mean, 12-year-olds want to get in on action. They're not going to be sitting in the temple talking to priests. So here I'm asking the question, is it normal that a 12-year-old boy is going to be hanging out in the temple? Well, it wouldn't have been normal based on uh, average 12-year-olds. But see, Jesus was different. He had a mission. He had a calling. He had a purpose that came straight from his father. And so we find him in the place where that most 12-year-olds would not be. I asked the question, had he slept? Had he eaten? We don't know. But one thing that we do know is... He was diligently following through with what God required of him. Look at verse 49. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? I must be about my father's business. There's the family business I was mentioning at the beginning. But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. The Bible tells us that the people, including his own mama, were amazed. I find it quite ironic that 21 years from this moment here that there's another period of three days. In 21 years from now, Mary would find herself waiting once again, wondering what's going to happen. And it would be three days in this same area, the same city of Jerusalem. But you see, that something changed between the time of uh, Jesus as a 12-year-old and Jesus as a 33-year-old. Because when I studied the Gospels, I looked diligently and I tried to find the mentioning of Mary, the mother of Jesus, at the tomb, and it's not there. There's no mention of the mother ever going to the tomb. She doesn't go with anointing oil. That's 
uh, Mary Magdalene, and then you've got Mary, the mother of Joseph, and, and uh, you've got a few other women. Some of them aren't named. But we do understand that each time that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is in the vicinity, that the Bible specifically calls out her name. So why in the world is it, uh, is it a fact that Mary, the mother of Jesus, cannot be found at the tomb? Well, I don't know absolutely sure, but I felt as I was studying this week, prompted by the Holy Ghost, that it might just be connected to what happened when he was 12 years old because see mother got anxious back then she got worried mama mary and, and daddy joseph were frantic they thought oh no we've not just lost a kid a boy we've lost the son of god but by the time they found him where they left him somebody get with me this morning by the time they found him where they left him they discovered there was an amazing factor because he wasn't doing what other 12 year old boys were doing he wasn't flirting with the girls and daddy joseph had to get his rod out and say don't you flirt with them Bo uh, girls yet Jesus because you got to wait about four more you no they didn't have to do that they didn't have to get on to him for anything because the fact of the matter is Jesus spoke up with a word that was divinely inspired and he said mama didn't you know that I had to be I must be about my father's business so here's what I believe church that during the three days you've got on the third day Mary Magdalene going to anoint the body you got the other women disciples hanging out in some place where that they're uh, scared of the Roman soldiers wondering is Pilate coming after us wondering is the high priest going to arrest us but Mama Mary is quiet you don't hear much from her but here's what I believe was happening just like when Jesus was born and the shepherds went out declaring the word of the Lord the Bible tells us she pondered all these things in her heart when he was 12 years old what did she do well in verse 51 of chapter Luke we've been reading then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them because his mother kept all these things in her heart. So during that three days time, you know, I can just imagine that while everyone else is anxious, just like her and Joseph were, while everyone else is wondering what are we going to do, just like Moses, I mean just like Joseph and Mary, while everybody else is concerned and stressed out, Mary sits by and ponders all these things in her heart because she knew, Peter, don't you get all discouraged. James, don't get so worried that you give up. John, don't worry, it's just a little bit longer because when Jesus comes up missing for three days it ain't over because he's just going about his father's business don't give up Mary don't give up Mary Magdalene don't give up uh, Bartholomew don't give up Thaddeus I done been down this road before I got stressed out I got anxious but honey let me tell you when he's gone for three days it ain't over he's just about the father's business somebody give him glory today mm, yeah he said, I must be about my father's business. You know what God's looking for at the New Haven Church of God? He's looking for people who don't just need a miracle. He's looking for people who must have a miracle. He doesn't want people who just need some of Jesus. He's looking for a church who must have all of Jesus that they can receive. He don't want a church that just needs a touch of the Holy Ghost. He wants a church that'll get in the altar for three hours and say, my God, I must have the baptism baptism of heaven's sweet holy ghost somebody give him praise ah he don't he don't want people at new haven who just need to be free god said michael tell them i'm looking for somebody who must be set free at all cost yeah glory 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 she kept all these things in her heart because she realized he had to be he must be about his father's business so in this particular story what was the family business that i've been preaching about this morning luke 2 47 and all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers no matter how educated that these teachers in the temple were they were astonished at his understanding as a 12 year old boy so what was jesus doing to carry out the father's business he was giving answers to those who needed them. What is our mission if we're going to be a part of the Father's business here in this city? It is to bring people the same thing that you had to have. The answer. You needed to know. Why am I here? What is my purpose? Why was I ever born? It doesn't make sense. The other day, Chloe asked me a question. She said, Daddy, I know this sounds weird, but sometimes I wonder... 
am I really here? Sometimes I have those crazy thoughts and I'm thinking, is this all just a dream or am I, am I alive? And if so, why am I here? And I let her know, that's not crazy. I said, I've thought those thoughts many times. A lot of people have too. You just, you wonder things and, and you start getting confused thinking, why in the world were we chosen to live on this earth? I mean, we could have just been never existing. You know, just like uh, we imagine we could have been. And, 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 and what a miracle it is that God spoke us into existence. Think about that. You could have never existed if God didn't get involved. But he chose to let you be born. He chose for Corey to wake up one morning in, in that hospital room and to be born as a, a young boy. He chose Jesse Collier to be born on this planet. Isn't that a miracle? It's a miracle to know that you've got a purpose. This precious baby boy back here that, that they brought with them. Uh, I spoke to earlier. What a miracle that child is. That he's even here. We don't realize what a miracle it is when people are born. But I ask the question, what is our purpose? And the world must have an answer. Because they're asking that question every day when they flip through their newspaper. Or they go onto their phone out and they look up their daily horoscope. You know what they're wanting to know? What's the answer? Where do I go from here? Man, I mean, if it was me, I wouldn't want stars directing my path which way I'm going to go. But people are so desperate wanting an answer, they'll follow stars. They'll say, man, if somebody can decipher the, the movement of my, um, the month that I was born in and the way those stars lined up and, and the prediction for today, I just needed some answers. Why in the world do you think people go to palm readers? Isn't it because they want to get involved with witchcraft and they're, they're wanting to open themselves up to the demonic realm? They don't want to do that. They're going because they want answers. The only problem is they don't realize they do open themselves up to demonic activity when they seek out that type of, of answer, that type of assistance. Why do people, and boy, this burned me up. I've told you this before, but I went uh, to the music store. You probably know which one I'm talking about, in the mall. I can't think of the name of it because I didn't even look. I just walked in and was looking at music. Man, I can't hear you. FYE, yes, let's give them a bad advertisement this morning. Now, I'm not, I'm, not I'm not against them, but I do want to say this negative thing about their company, that in the back left corner, I was with Chloe, and we're looking at all these little action figures, you know, like Marvel, and, oh, there's Iron Man, there's Captain America. I was getting all excited over these little action figures, and then, lo and behold, I look, and we're moving around into that back left corner, and what I see there, a Ouija board, a, a box. It's got a Ouija board in it, and Chloe's looking at that thing, and like, well, she knows what they are, but she's like, is that real? And I told her, I said, it can be. You start messing with it, it'll get real quick. And you can invite demons to begin moving through you to control that, that little triangular-shaped item. And, and it'll move the glass over the letters, and it'll talk to you. A lot of people, you know, it's, it's not always demonic. Sometimes people will move it themselves, and it's not a demon. It's what I meant to say, but it's always evil. But my point is, I got, I got mad. And, of course, you know what she said? I want to take that thing and tear it up. Like, well, God bless you. I won't tell nobody. <laughs> Jesus will forgive you. No, I didn't do that. We didn't tear it up. But what, what we've got to be careful of, there, there are so many things out there that appear to be an answer to us. You know, there's advice people can give you that's all messed up. And they will be sincere when they tell you what they tell you. And sometimes they'll base it off their experience, what they went through and what they did, and it worked for them. But you know what? It might not work for you. That's why you cannot base every decision off what somebody tells you will be best. You need the one who knows all. You need the answer. You need the way, the truth, and the life. And his name is Jesus Christ. Amen? Oh, I love him. Can I tell a quick story? I don't think I shared this with the church. I know I talked last week about um, one of my little episodes, the uh, Buddhist, I think it was. Anyway, I don't remember if I told you all about Little Caesars as far as in here, did I? It's like a week ago. You know, I've been on this kick lately. I can't keep my mouth shut <laughs> about Jesus. I'm sitting in Little Caesars. This will probably be my closing since I'm talking about food. It'll be a good time to close. Sitting in Little Caesars, getting ready for a pepperoni and a cheese pizza, yeah. And so here I am, and this guy standing there, and he's an atheist. Did I tell all y'all about this yet? All right. He's an atheist. feel like I'm on a talk show or something. He comes in there, and he's like, yeah, there is no God. And, you know, he, of course, he, don't, he actually talks normal. I shouldn't, I shouldn't miss 
represented. Thank you. And, you know, there's a few people in there talking to him, and this innocent little 18-year-old girl, and she's real sweet. And she, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you can tell that she's, she doesn't agree with him, but she doesn't want to argue. And he, he uh, says something about, uh, well, how do you know there's a God? And the person behind the counter says, well, intelligent design. You know, there's got to be a creator. And he said, oh, intelligent design, that argument, that's so old, that, that doesn't work, that, that doesn't prove anything. And so he tried to go off on this kick about how there was no God. Of course, I'm sitting there, and Roxy Jane's just, she keeps talking to me about the Supreme Pizza picture. And, look, look, look. and, and, and so I'm, I'm trying to hear this conversation and deal with her. And then customers start piling in there, and the guy just says, well, I'll talk to you all later. He walks out. All right, so here I am, and I'm thinking, man, I have got to say something because it's just burning in me like Jeremiah talked about. And, and so everybody's standing there for a minute, about a minute, and I said, you know what? Of course, Roxy Jane's like, what are you doing, Daddy? You know what? I said, you know one thing that I really get excited about. And, of course, here's the guy behind the counter, and he's thinking, what's this guy going to do here? So, you know, one thing I get excited about is because when you go overseas and you got these missionaries that walk over there, these people don't know anything about Jesus. They don't know who God is. But all of a sudden, you get a missionary start laying hands on people that are dead, and speaking not in, oh, and I got real. I said this. I said, not in the name of Buddha. I said, it ain't in the name of Allah. It's not in the name of any other religion you want to think up with your little bitty brain. I said, only, my Lord, only in the name of Jesus do dead people get up out of coffin. Only in the name of Jesus do little children who are breathing their last breath and, and the witch doctor's done done his garbage and he can't do squat and a missionary walks in the hut and says, but I tell you, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Rise up and walk. And man, all of a sudden, the people in a little Caesars are looking around thinking, whoa, man, what's going on here? And the little girl, 18-year-old girl, speaks something. She says, you just made my day because I'm a Christian and I've got people around me who act like I'm crazy because I love Jesus, but thank you for telling me what you just did. And I didn't quit then. I said, I'll tell you something else. <laughs> By this time, I was about to pull me up that cash register and let it be a pulpit. I'm going to tell you something. Church of the little Caesars. I spoke up. And I said, I'll tell you something else that the atheists cannot refute. I said, there was something God set them up a long time ago and they didn't even know it. He put a conscience in them. They, the Bible says in, oh, I got biblical. I said, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that even the Gentiles are a law unto themselves. They didn't have the law of Moses, but they had a conscience. And every time that one of them picked up a knife and was about to kill somebody, they knew even without the law of Moses, I, I'm not supposed to do this. Something doesn't feel right on the inside. That's what Paul talked about when he said the Gentiles are a law unto themselves. Even without the law, they are still held accountable because they've got a conscience. I said, so when you're dealing with those atheists, here's what you do. Don't argue with them. Don't debate. Just plant seeds talking about Jesus. Speak about the crucifixion. Speak about the resurrection because here's what's going to happen. They may deny what you say to your face, but when they go home, that part where God set them up, that conscience is going to start burning on the inside. They might not get saved. But you know what they're going to have? They're going to have a seed planted in them that will not leave them until the time they leave this earth. It's going to burn so hot, they're going to try to remain atheists. They're going to get around their atheist professors. They're going to get around their atheist friends, and they're going to talk about, well, there can't be no God. Intelligent design just can't exist. And all the time, because Brianna Beard stood up in a class and spoke about the name of Jesus, because Colton Penrod talked to somebody at the mall, because Ed spoke to somebody at the workplace, they're going to say, man, why is it that I can't get what he said out of me I can't get away from it I try to I wash it away I try to watch I read my atheist books and it won't get out of me what's going on I'll tell you what it is church of the living God it's the truth and nothing but the truth there is one way one truth one life and his name is Jesus somebody give him praise I wish I could say after that, Little Caesars had Holy Ghost Revival, but they didn't. They started ringing up $5 pizzas, and we went back to our business. <laughs> Hallelujah. Stand with me. What is our family business? It is this. God says you've got to give the world the answer. What was Jesus, uh, what business was he being about in Luke? He was giving them answers. He was explaining stuff that they should have been explaining to a 12-year-old, but instead, the Messiah at age 12 was explaining to them, I've come to give you the answer. 
What's our role? It's to quit being afraid of offending people. It's to quit. I know sometimes this illustration gets old. Please forgive me. But why in the world, if I had the cure for somebody's disease, would I be so afraid of offending them because they wanted to keep taking a pill and over and over, and they felt a little bit better when they took the pill, and I've got the cure. Why in the world would I be so afraid of offending the, the pill company and offending the person taking the pill by messing up their schedule? Oh, if I give you this, guess what? You're not going to have to take a pill every morning at 6. Oops, that might offend you. Same concept with Christianity. Why in the world should I be afraid of offending somebody by giving them the truth? The answer where they won't have to keep feeding that, that fleshly part of themselves and saying, oh, it makes me feel better for about three hours. And then I'm missing something again. Oh, it felt good this tonight. Oh, it felt so good for 15 minutes. Ah, oh, now I'm missing something again. Why not give them the answer that only comes through Jesus where that they never lose that peace again? Mm. Where they don't have a high and then come back down. See, that's the answer I've got this morning. I've got an answer when everybody's in the building. We can have Holy Ghost revival and the Lord can move and I can feel shaken to my soul. And then on Saturday nights when no one's here at all and the lights except for that row, everything's shut down. There's no music going. I can get along with the same God and have personal revival just like if every one of you were in here. Why is that? Because he is the answer. And he's not about putting on a show. He's not about filling up buildings. It's not about millions of dollars. He's about the relationship with you. That's what he cares about. It's always been about you. It's always been about you. His desire for you. Close your eyes, please. Heavenly Father, you designed us to be a part of your family business. You gave us a mandate, a calling, a purpose. And Lord, whether we realized it or not, all along throughout the years, you were pulling us. You were saying, I I'm pulling you toward that purpose. I, I designed you for this. You can either go with me or go another way. But you're going to have perfect peace if you'll walk in me, walk in what I have for you. God, I'm praying this morning that we'll make a recommitment as a, a body of believers. That Lord, even if we've gotten our eyes off you and we've lost sight, like Mary and Joseph did, we've lost sight of Jesus for three days. Lord, I thank you that we're going to find you where we left you. We're coming back, Lord, to a heart of worship. We're coming back to where we left you. And we're going to renew that vow of our first love. In Jesus' name. I want to invite everyone today to come and fill these altars. Everybody in the building, I want to invite you to come. Find you a place. Renew that commitment. Renew that vow. Say, God, I'm coming back to my first love. Lord, I might have left you for a while. There might have been a few days where I lost sight of you. But, Lord, I'm coming back. I want to, I want to get a renewed vision. I want to reconnect with my answer. And there may be some of you who have really been struggling when you're talking to people about Jesus. And say, man, I don't know what to say. And today God's inspired you again. You said, wait a minute. All i got to do is plant the seed. Just plant the seed. Hallelujah. Everyone that is physically able, I want you to come up in these altars and let's pray together.